Good evening, everyone. As you all arrive into our room this evening, our Zoom room, I'd like to welcome you to Medill. My name is Stacy Simpson, and I am the Associate Director of Special Events at Medill. And we're thrilled to have you here for our evening program, which I think you'll all thoroughly enjoy. Uh, if you should have questions during our conversation, please enter those in the Q&A section below. We will hope to get to all of those before we finish up in our short hour. Um, also, if you'd like to purchase the Genus Americanus book, it will be available. There's going to be a pre-order posted on our final slide as we leave this evening. Um, make sure you stay around just to jot down that link and that will take you to a pre-order at Bookends and Beginnings in Evanston, Illinois, where you can order the book. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Medill Associate Professor Doug Foster. Doug is a former editor of Mother Jones Magazine, public television investigative reporter and correspondent, documentary producer, and author of After Mandela, The Struggle for Freedom in Post-Apartheid South Africa. He writes about politics, global issues, and science for outlets such as The Atlantic, The Nation, The American Scholar, and The Los Angeles Times. So he's a very busy man, but he was nice enough to give his time this evening to be, act as our moderator with our very special guests. So without further ado, Doug, I hand it over to you. Thanks, Stacy, for that and for all that the staff at Medill does in maintaining for us a sense of real community um, in these times of living and working remotely. Uh, and welcome to those of you who are joining us from around the city, the country, the world. Uh, what we're going to do in the next hour is share in a journey, a special journey of discovery. We're going to take a road trip with our former dean and two of his students. That road trip began in Evanston in 2011 as part of a searching exploration about the complicated ways people in our country define themselves and the malign persistence of racism, sexism, and economic deprivation. Since this is the kind of trip none of us could safely take right now, we wouldn't be welcome anyway wandering from state to state. I found in my own reading of Genus Americanus a welcome reminder of what doing journalism actually felt like up until just uh, 10 months ago. It's a, re a, a very rich, deep, provocative, troubling book with enough description of meals along the road, bad and better, that will leave you hungry for more. And it's also very funny in parts, especially when the three storytellers turn their sense of humor on themselves. The book provided welcome relief for me from that sense of uh, constraint and being all tucked in about so many upended plans I'd had to cover this crazy election and, and even a crazier year. So come along then, hit the road with us for the next hour. Your guides on the road on this trip are Lauren Giglioni, our former Dean and beloved colleague joining us from Martha's Vineyard. He's not only the author of previous terrific books, but a former everything you can name, take a stab at it and fill in the blank. Senatorial aide, newspaper publisher, president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, Pulitzer Prize juror, and a lifetime advocate of diversity in hiring, recruitment of students, and changing curriculum. Elisa Karras, joining us from New Jersey, was born in Pittsburgh and graduated from Medill in the year she, Dan, and Lauren set out across the country. After leaving Evanston, she had stints at newspapers in Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Oregon, and now serves as Associate Director of Audience Development at Vanity Fair. Her blogs from the entire trip are still available online, and they're a real pleasure to read. Her latest tweet, by the way, under a photo of a pistachio orchard brags that she has, quote, seen the world's largest pistachio, unquote, 
which I only slip in here because she and Dan are foodies. And the third member of this trio, Dan Tham, joining us from Hong Kong, was born and raised in Salt Lake City. He's currently an international producer of global features at CNN. The last two stories of his that I saw demonstrated an astonishing range. Beautifully shot stories about street food in Saigon on the one hand and sex trafficking of children in Cambodia on the other. Dan has written this about the experience of uh, working on this book with Lauren and Elisa. Quote, growing up as the gay and Vietnamese son of refugees in Salt Lake City, I was always aware of and disheartened by how my intersecting identities made me an other. But working on this book about America's identity with these two incredible journalists helped me navigate my own sense of belonging in the United States. So those are our guides. Let's get started right at the beginning of the journey by turning to Lauren and asking, maybe in a tone of disbelief, what in the world led you to decide uh, at the age of 70 to take a 14,500 mile journey retracing Mark Twain's life with these uh, two student students along? What made you think uh, that was a great idea, Lauren, back then? Well, uh, getting out on the road is, uh at any age is fun, freedom, adventure. Uh, I wanted to diminish my ignorance about uh, issues of uh, race, inclusion, identity that are important to me, I care about. I hope to research um, down every possible Gillione in America, uh, truck driver, Catholic deacon, collector of antique autos, uh, pop singer. I plan to visit some friends from earlier stages in my life. And uh, for example, um, a uh, death row uh, inmate from Louisiana State Penitentiary, um, a former student of mine from Rust College, a historically black college I taught at uh, during Freedom Summer, summer of 64. And last but not least, I wanted to teach, I uh, put teach in quotation marks here, a course uh, with a class of one, Dan Pham. I hoped uh, it would be uh, um, travel as transformative teaching. And um, Dan endured uh, 36 museum visits, a six day a week dawn to dusk schedule of uh, videoing, interviewing, driving the van, eating roadside food. And uh, if we didn't have a Medill alum to stay with, uh, enduring uh, the cheapest hotels and motels we could find. Uh, our Cleveland hotel, to quote TripAdvisor, is the filthiest in America and advised, do not stay here. For all this, Medill awarded Dan one credit hour, not the regular three, hour, three hours of credit. So um, Dan and Elisa, same question. What in the world were you thinking of when you um, agreed to go on this journey with this crazy professor of yours. Dan, do you want to start? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I was happy to take that one credit because thankfully I had enough credits from AP and IB classes in high school, you know, to make sure I get that diploma. So, um, so really it was just an email I think I got from Medill. Um, Kind of, you know, I hadn't met Lauren yet, I don't think, and um, I, you know, it was just the the description was too tantalizing to resist. It was, you know, take a road trip during fall quarter with this professor, follow the path of Mark Twain, interview a bunch of Americans, and uh, yeah. So I, of course, I applied, and, and I'm really happy I did. So I guess the the moral of the story is to to check your emails and to read them thoroughly because you might find amazing opportunities in them. <laughs> Um, I would say that I can confirm that our hotel in Cleveland um, was indeed the filthiest in America, seeing as we have <laughs> stayed in 60 to 80 hotels in America. Um, <laughs> and I also didn't know that we would meet um, about half of America's guillones um, on the trip. So that was a bit of a surprise for me <laughs> when we started out. 
Um, but I also saw the email and um, it was, Lauren definitely asked only for um, students and I was a senior and I was like, well, I'm sort of a student for like three more weeks. Um, and I was definitely looking to postpone real life at, as long as I could. And this was your idea of what postponing real life would look like. Okay, we'll go on. Uh, the, the first leg of the trip um, was Elisa and Lauren to Hannibal, uh, Missouri. Let's set the scene uh, there. What were those first couple days like for you, Elisa? Um, well, Doug, I, I'm just going to politely correct you. It's Alyssa. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, well, Lauren pulled up um, in a Dodge Grand Caravan um, minivan one fall morning in Evanston, and you would be shocked as to how many crates of research files um, can fit in one van. I was very concerned about, you know, have I brought too many shoes? Lauren had newspaper clippings like for the last 200 years. Um, so that was <laughs> definitely what the scene looked like. Um, but our first stop was um, a place called Cahokia Mounds in Illinois, um, which is, you know, one of the first earliest um, and largest civilizations um, in America, and they weirdly required us to, you know, if we wanted to take notes, to wear these things um, called writing permits. Um, so we had these little laminated badges that said writing permit um, hanging around our necks. And I still feel a little bit bad about this, but I stole mine at the end because I just thought it was the weirdest thing. Um, and when I told Lauren <laughs> that I stole it, he was, and not too mad. So I was like, okay, we're going to get along just fine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you were, you were, you had just flown back from India, if I'm remembering right, uh, from a trip uh, from India. What were your initial uh, impressions of that landscape and the trip uh, as you prepared to set off on it? Yeah, um, I kind of, you know, kind of combine my summer and fall of 2011 into kind of one continuum of exploring identity issues. Um, I, I was in India with another Medill student um, on a Lund grant, um, which was an amazing opportunity through Medill to um, to report on various issues around the world. We were basically we were interviewing um, Tibetan youth that were living in Dharamsala, India. Um, it's kind of like how they interfaced with their identity. So. Um, you know, hopping back to the U.S., super jet lagged. Um, I felt like we were. I was kind of continuing the same kind of work. You know, um, talking to Americans who, in some ways, felt like they were outliers or outsiders in their own society. Um, I, yeah, I remember the first night we were. It was a. It was like a concert of uh, in in Hannibal, Missouri. Of um, you know, uh, I think it was like a Mark Twain uh, themed CD. That was it was a release party and I, I remember feeling very dazed and it felt like a dream but um you know as soon as i got over the jet lag i was able to really plug in and kind of serve as a videographer for the trip lauren what was it like in those early weeks for you to be in a van uh stuffed with those thousand word uh, uh pages of uh, newspaper clippings that elisa mentioned uh <laughs> the students two and a half generations younger than you well, I had traveled with, as you know, with uh, students uh, in South Africa in vans for 12 years. So some of it wasn't uh, new, but we were with ourselves uh, seven days a week in that van. So it was different in that respect. Uh, I just, I guess uh, I was, they were extremely thoughtful. I remember when we, we t talked to an agent for the book, uh, she wanted to have uh, more about, you know, tension between you and uh, and the young journalists. And I said, well, you know, they really weren't. They were very nice. They were, uh, you know, they, they were almost protective of me. Uh, and um, so uh, they also endured my uh, technological incompetence, explained things about the internet that I didn't understand. Uh, they endured my insistence on keeping to a schedule because we had to get the rented van back to Northwestern on a certain date. And uh, so that meant waking up at 7 a.m., getting on the road very early and driving into the night often. 
And um, then, uh, you know, when I had an opportunity to stop at a Starbucks to pick up uh, a day of the New York Times, sometimes going out of the way, they had to put up with that as well. So uh, I think they were very generous in, in dealing with my idiosyncrasies. So and they were- Go ahead. What were the, the most striking um, moments for each of you on that first half of the trip, if we can kind of move from east uh, uh, to west, uh, the most striking person you met in the first half of the trip? Elisa, I think uh, Tedra Franks and Occupy Wall Street were highlights for you. Yes, they were. Um, so Tedra Franks, her um, nickname is actually Big Mama. And um, she was just an amazing person that we encountered in St. Louis. Um, so we, we just picked up, you know, sort of an alt weekly newspaper in St. Louis and had read about a homeless camp um, next to the Mississippi River called Hopeville. Um, so, you know, it, it's a homeless camp, so it didn't have an address. Um, and we, you know, asked, you know, where can we find this? And I'm like, all right, just go down the street and you'll hit the river and like, you'll see it. So we didn't really know what we were looking for. Um, and we got out of the van and, and we did see some people and we, you know, explained what we were doing and asked if there was anyone we could speak to. Um, and the man said, oh yeah, you'll want to talk to the mayor. And we're like, a mayor like of a homeless camp hmm, that sounds kind of interesting um so we called over this woman um named big mama and she just turned out to be such a vivacious energetic um like sort of no nonsense woman and was just so generous with her time um and took us around and explained everything um and it just felt really spontaneous um and she was just such a character. Um, and I followed up with her um, a few times over the years and you know, she has found housing um, and is pursuing her education. So that was just a really nice story for me um, to kind of see that progression. So I just um, wanted to bracket one thing. So this community, this homeless community is called Hopeville and it's got a mayor. And yeah. you're walking into a, a situation that I assume is unlike uh, anything you that you've seen before. So what was it like to, to interview Big Mama, the mayor of Hopeville, um, across those lines of difference? She, her life experience so different from yours, right? Yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, I think one of the things that I thought about a lot on the trip, because as you mentioned, we're, we're talking to people who are, you know, come from all walks of life, all races, you know, all economic classes. Um, there was just a lot of diversity in the people that we spoke to. Um, was I was always thinking like, okay, Americans, are we the same or are we different? That was always the question that I was trying to answer for myself. Um, and I didn't really answer it, but my like half answer is that we are the same, but we've had different experiences. Um, so I always try to remember like there, there will always be um, some shared experiences and some grains of truth and recognition in every single person that you speak to. Um, but keep in mind, they have experienced different things and how do you speak to them? Um, with empathy um, and curiosity and and respect, um, and people were so generous with their time, and I I felt really humbled by that. Dan, there were a couple of people who really stood out for you too. I think Priscilla Cooper and Ingrid uh, Matson. Yeah, um, Priscilla Cooper, we met in Cleveland, Ohio, and um, you know it, it was so striking going from Chicago and St. Louis to things like Cleveland, which, I mean, just the appearance, it just felt like it had fallen on hard times. It was, it was very impoverished. It was very clear. So we wanted to talk about economic inequality um, when we were there. And so Priscilla was a former wealth recipient who started an anti-poverty program in the city. And what struck me about her interview is when she talked about how being cash poor, being financially poor, isn't just simply that. It, it's also, you know, there are other kind of stereotypes and, and perceptions that get added to it. You're, you're also morally poor, you're, you're educationally poor, 
Um, so that really kind of struck a chord with me and, and really resonated with me, um, just kind of unpacking the complexity of, of poverty in America. Um, and then the other person that really stuck out to me was Ingrid Mattson, um, who's a professor of Is Islamic studies and a prominent Muslim leader in the US. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a little embarrassed to, to admit my own blind spots a little bit, but, you know, I think I came into the interview with a bit of unconscious bias. Um, I, I guess I was kind of so surprised and, and struck by how candid and forthcoming and most engaging she was. And it just kind of made me, after the interview, I remember, you know, going back to the motel room and just thinking about, um, you know, 9-11 and sort of how Muslims have been perceived in the country after that event and to what extent Islamophobia or, or maybe, you know, unconscious bias had seeped into, you know, my perception of this community. So um, both of those interviews, you know, just in the first half of the trip really, really touched me and, and taught me a lot. Lauren, same question to you, that first half, who were the, who were the people who really jump to top of mind as you're remembering that trip? Well, it's hard for me to pinpoint one or two people. Just taking Priscilla Cooper and Ingrid Madsen, for example, there is a pattern of, I think, women taking leadership roles and trying, and trying to bring positive change on issues of discrimination or unconscious bias. Uh, and uh, so, I put those women in a group of people that I met, uh, or that we met. Connie Ritter was the first person we interviewed, uh, an African-American uh, guide uh, at uh, the Birthplace Museum, Mark Twain, uh, who um, uh, put up a slavery exhibit uh, at, the, at the museum. And uh, it, was, it was fascinating, she had a, uh, you know, one of these iron balls that they would uh, attach to, to the uh, ankle of a slave so they could not escape. And it was, it was a very moving exhibit in an area of the, uh, of the state that's known as Little Dixie, where there, where there were uh, a large number of plantations and, and lynchings. Uh, the, the exhibit was uh, after she retired. Uh, she was the only African-American there. Uh, um, the exhibit came down, and so I kept going back and asking about that uh, the slavery exhibit she put up, and well, when is it going to be put up again? And the first time they said, "Well, hey, we need to get permission on the photos." And the next time I went back, well, it's going to be a long time. And uh, you know, it struck me in the time of Trump, sort of a signal of how people were dealing with race or not dealing with it. So that was disturbing to me. And there were other people. Uh, equally uh, uh, moving to me when uh, I'm thinking of, and one of them was uh, a Medill alum, Lizzie Adala, who was uh, uh, facing deportation because um, she got a notice while she was at Medill and we interviewed her. Um, and uh, it's still not clear whether she will be able to stay in the United States. She's regarded as one of those, quote, dreamers. And um, she's working in Washington now to. Uh, to help um, uh, immigration uh, reform. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm just uh, so impressed. There was another woman that uh, I skipped over in my thinking, Barbara Zeman, and also in Chicago, uh, a woman who uh, uh, was determined to be a priest. And uh, ultimately, there's an organization of women priests that who are danger. And uh, she, uh, she, served a con LGBTQ uh, congregation in Chicago, didn't meet at a Catholic church, of course. But again, she's, uh, you know, part of a, a, an effort to bring uh, a new view of uh, service in the Catholic church to, all, to every, every Catholic. And uh, I was so impressed by her as well. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you decided um, where to go. It seems like part of the time you're hewing to a, a, a Twain trajectory, and other times somebody is mention, mentioning a Guy Leone somewhere, um, you know, in another state, and you're going there. Um, 
how did you uh, how did you decide uh, how much of it was plotted out and how much of it was jazz improvisation? Are you asking me that question? <laughs> any any of the three? What's your theory? Sure. Uh, well, we had an outline for the trip, uh, and because I had to know when the, to get the band back, <laughs> and. Uh, and there's the map. Uh, <laughs> and we were following Mark Twain from, he quit school at 12 years old in, uh, in, in uh, Missouri, in uh, Hannibal, Missouri. And then he went up to New York. He was a printer's devil and uh, went to Philadelphia and so on. Then he came back through Cincinnati, met a guy who persuaded him uh, or, or encouraged him to be a riverboat pilot. And uh, he trained to do that and then did that up until the Civil War occurred and, he, and the river was closed. So he moved up and helped his brother put out uh, print shops and newspapers in, in uh, Iowa. And then he uh, went west to be a reporter uh, and uh, in Nevada and uh, San Francisco. And then we added Seattle to the trip, I confess, because uh, the Guilliones, uh, after they moved from villages in northern Italy to New York City, went out west when uh, they thought uh, they were going to go out to, you know, get gold in the Yukon area, and they wound up in Seattle instead. And uh, my great grandfather had a pasta company there, and uh, and so and their son was a doctor there, and so uh, I was interested in, as I explained before, roots research. So uh, there were sort of serendipitous things along the way. You know, we went by uh, in Kansas a, uh, a sign that said uh, the Kickapoo Nation, and that sounded interesting. So we made a left turn and uh, spent a day and a half with the Kickapoo, and uh, that was a quite moving experience. And it became a kind of uh, it it, tra it it showed me how ignorant I was about Native Americans in America, and so I. Then when I got back to Northwestern, uh, tried to diminish my ignorance, and we started teaching a course at Medill about called Native Americans Tell Their Story, and it involved the students going into Chicago to interview people. So the trip was quite influential in my life in that way. Let's talk a little bit of, uh, more about Twain and his role in the reflections for all three of you as you move through the country. Uh, one thing that strikes me about the history is the reminder that Twain himself grows up in a family that holds in bondage an enslaved person. Uh, in the years leading up to the Civil War, he's in St. Louis in 1857, when one of the most uh, despicable cases ever decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, Dred Scott, uh, comes with a wrenchingly racist decision by the Chief Justice. Um, do you think that Twain's experience of seeing slavery and in some senses growing up in a family that participated in slavery was influential in the development of his anti-racist views, at least uh, in terms of Black folks? Well, I think uh, his experiences, human experiences, uh, permitted him to feel uh, that he, to, to see uh, African Americans as human beings. And even though he was being taught uh, in, in church uh, a different lesson uh, about them, um, it's not that he was, I, I, would not, I always feel uncomfortable saying, oh, he was an anti-racist. I don't think he was. I think it was he, he had some ambivalence about how he felt about uh, African Americans. And certainly in his attitude toward Native Americans and Muslims, um, he showed that uh, uh, I think what would you call white supremacy or whatever you want to label it. Um, so, yeah, that, but that really struck me too, Lauren, that he could be, he could call the country the United States of Lynchardom on one hand. Yes and then be so rankly racist toward Native Americans and Muslims too, right? Yes, that's correct. Well, I think, uh, you know, he, he, he was not a well-educated person. He left school at a very young age. And so uh, his life experience was quite limited in terms of Native Americans. He heard stories from his mother about 
how they were savages and killed people, etc. And the same about Muslims. And uh, so in essence, Innocence Abroad, he's quite brutal in how he talks about them, even though I suspect he had no real experience with Muslims and Arabs and, and uh, people he described from North Africa. Um, so maybe that's, I think- Maybe that's part of the lesson is that um, he had views that while you say, uh, and I agree, weren't anti-racist, were ahead of um, many of his contemporary whites uh, in terms of his attitude toward, attitude towards black folk, but the people he didn't know well, didn't have uh, experience with uh, growing up or afterwards, that's where the animus was especially rank. Yes, and also I think he uh, he sometimes overblown um, stuff that was intentionally, you know, trying to satire, satire is trying to make fun of virtually every human being and every class of person and so on. So some of this is for effect. I do remember, you know, when he went to Yale to speak once, he uh, had as his tour guide an African-American student from the law school. And he was really taken with him and he understood that this student had to do a lot of menial jobs to pay his way through school. And he quietly went to the dean of the law school and said, I want to pay for this student's way at the law school. And it's not something that's much not well known about him. But I, I do think that, uh, you know, there was, uh, he did learn as he went through life and it's reflected in his behavior, some of his behavior. So, but he didn't experience much of, a, of Native Americans that really could uh, dampen this kind of bigotry that he expressed in his books. So, Elisa, I think that gets us halfway through the journey, um, halfway uh, across the country, maybe to Kansas or so. What stands out to you as particularly significant moment or person in that middle part of the story? Yeah, um, so I think two main things. The first being, for me, I think that was the first time that I had seen um, so many small towns. Um, and I think the three of us felt that there was sort of a desolation to some of them that we hadn't really realized existed. Um, you know, we saw a lot of economic disparity um, and and poverty, and, and I think that surprised me, you know, certainly at that time, you know, and, and still sometimes the pervasive narrative about America is, you know, it's just the land of, of prosperity. So I, being confronted with that in real life um, sort of shook me a little bit, to be honest. Um, and I think the other important um, experience that we had sort of midway through the trip was, as Lauren said, sort of on a whim, um, we, we saw a sign for the Golden Eagle Casino in, I think, Kansas, um, and ended up um, very graciously being welcomed um, by one of the tribe members um, of, of the Kickapoo. Um, and, and we really had such an ignorance, um, at least speaking on behalf of myself, about Native American culture. Um, and you know the, the man Curtis Simon, um, he took us around um, and set up a few interviews with us, um, and it was just amazing um, to speak to people um, on the reservation and and to really connect with them. And actually, we did I would say had had a quite tense interview um, with someone where you know we really came up against cultural differences that I had never considered really. You know, many of our um, questions are always, you know, sort of very goal oriented and have a, a sort of clear path. And, and that just wasn't um, the way that this, this man wanted to be, you know, spoken to. Um, so it, you know, it really makes you evaluate who you are as a journalist, um, and then who you are as an American and, and what maybe you've missed, um, which I think was a lot. Um, so it was definitely a big learning experience uh, and informative for me at least. Uh, in this part of the book, Dan, I was thinking a lot about geography, um, mm -hmm. particularly the part of the country that um, my uh, colleagues at, at, at Berkeley, when I told them even that I was moving to Chicago to take a job at Northwestern, said, um, why are you going to fly over country? Um, so talk to us a little bit about that experience of moving through time and space geographically and maybe taking some of the 
kinds of turns that Elisa is talking about and ending up in a situation that you've never confronted um, before uh, with people who you've never uh, tried to uh, understand before. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess Salt Lake City, Utah might be considered flyover country by some metrics. It's definitely not, you know, the West or the East Coast. So, um, so definitely getting to see more of kind of like, you know, the, the internal organs of, of the U.S. and kind of, you know, Iowa and, and Kansas and, and Nebraska was extremely eye-opening for me. I'd never been in these places before. I, I think a bunch, you know, Alyssa and, and Lauren, we hadn't been to some of these places as well. So um, just to just to, you know, get your boots on the ground there and to, to see it with your own eyes and to meet the people there is so is very different from, you know, um, statistics or, or, you know, kind of a more amorphous theorizing about these places. So, um, yeah, getting to see it up close, I think, was, was a very important experience in terms of trying to understand America a little bit better. So a follow-up for both you and Elisa from different angles. Dan, you're gay and Asian, and you were on a cross-country whirly gig adventure uh, with two white, straight-identified comrades in, in this searching exploration of the complicated nature of identity. Elisa, you were uh, with two guys um, from two generations on the trip. So I'd like to hear a little bit of a reflection about, about that. What, uh, what you learned about seeing things from different angles and what it added to the trip um, that, that you were seeing things differently. Melissa, do you want to go first? Um, sure, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think for me, actually, you know, I am, we talk about this in the book, I'm, I'm pretty middle of the road. I'm white, I'm straight, I'm middle class, like, there, there's something terribly remarkable about that. Um, and uh, for me, I really had to evaluate, like I, I hadn't even considered the things that I am. I, I certainly just had approached so many things from a place of privilege um, and like I am the default. And I, I had to get out of that. Like I, yes, there are many white, straight, middle-class um, women out there, but not everybody is. and you know, how, how, do I, how does my presence affect um, how an interview subject is, is gonna feel? And, and I, re I remember um, we were interviewing Skip Gates um, at Harvard, right? Um, and we had a little bit, he, he was a little bit of, you know, cantankerous, I guess, to, to put it politely with us. And um, I remember him remarking on your appearance, um, which, Kind of, I guess, as a you know, as a cisgender male, kind of made me realize that sometimes you're placed in awkward positions that we might not be aware of or we might not be paying attention to. Um, uh, for for me, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, do you want to say something? The uh, the skip case uh, uh, interview was revealing to me, and I put it in the book that you know I didn't hear exactly what. Alyssa and Dan heard, and that it bothered me, you know, that I, I didn't pick up on something that they picked up on, but it was a good sort of lesson for me. Also, we, uh, one of the Gilionis we were encouraged to interview by his mother was a deacon of the Catholic Church, Deacon Gilioni, and uh, he expressed views toward um, women in leadership positions at the church, in the church, and uh, gay members of the church, which uh, were the, the official line, but were disturbing to me. And I was thinking, you know, as, as we were there going through the interview, you know, uh, gee, did I really think about how this was going to impact the students? And, you know, had I really thought things out uh, as much as I should have, because I could have anticipated what he would say. At any rate, there were, there were several instances where you know, this sort of thing, uncomfortable situation occurred. And then there was the funny thing. And uh, well, I don't know if it was funny, but uh, Dan treated it with humor uh, when we were in um, Indiana. Well, he met Dan, why don't you tell the story? I, I... Yeah, um, sure. We were in Marion, Indiana. and We were um, doing a story about 
how the city decided to or or decided not to really like commemorate the fact that it was the site of the last lynching in, in the north. Um, and, you know, the photograph of that lynching, you know, inspired Strange Fruit, which was popularized by Billie Holiday famously. Um, I remember we were getting lunch um, at a Japanese restaurant and um, and I was the only member of our party, I mean, who received chopsticks. And that, I mean, that, that was such, I mean, I know it seems small, but that's, that's by nature what a microaggression is, right? It's just kind of reminding you that, you know, you're considered the, the odd one out here, even if it's a Japanese restaurant and everyone should have received chopsticks actually. But, but yeah, I mean, I remember that small episode kind of um, being slightly disturbing. Um, I guess, you know, growing up in America, you know, as an Asian American, you are often confronted with this sort of perpetual foreigner stereotype, right? Being asked questions like, you know, what are you or, or where are you really from and that kind of thing. So, um, so really this, this trip uh, in a way was for me to, you know, along the way we, we interviewed a lot of Asian Americans and it kind of helped me gain some grounding and, and gain some understanding of, you know, the, the long history of, of Asians in this country. Um, and made me feel, I guess, less isolated, less, uh, you know, less of a foreigner, I guess. And, um, and, and also, you know, being gay as well, um, this trip kind of helped me gain a, also a deeper understanding of, of what intersectionality means and, and what, um, what it means to occupy, you know, um, multiple identities at once that are sometimes contradictory and sometimes kind of, you know, um, lead to more disadvantages, more advantages, what have you. So, um, so yeah, it was a, it was a good way for me to kind of unpack my own identity. So, so that was, and, you know, to travel with Lauren and Alyssa too, who's so open-minded and, um, and so kind was, you know, I couldn't have asked for better travel companions. In a way, Lauren, the, the, the trip is, a, is a searching exploration too of, uh, your own place in the American story, right? Um, your search for an understanding of your great grandfather, the, the immigrant ex experience of Italians and the rest. I mean, that's part of the reason you're looking for Gileonis everywhere you go and using that as a way to, to deepen your own understanding of who you are and how you fit into this picture, right? Yes, I, I think that's, uh, that's true. And, um... Um, I mean, uh, it was, uh, so it was not only the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial experience, uh, that, um, you know, I was sort of proud of my great grandfather that he came as an indentured worker. He had to work for three years before, uh, to pay his way over. And I knew some of that story. Indeed, I went back to Northern Italy before this trip, uh, to, uh, to interview people in the village that he came from and, and the village that my great grandmother came from. So I had some knowledge, but I, um, I, I was just interested in also my great grandmother, you know, the values she had, uh, thrift. Uh, she, uh, she expected her husband, she ran the family. She expected her husband to bring home his pay every week. And when he didn't, uh, bring it all home entirely. Yet, well, I took the guys out for a drink, uh, and he sh gave her five bucks. She threw the the five bucks into a furnace, and uh, uh, you know there were great stories about uh, cleaning, like, how she cleaned the house, and 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 uh, her idealism, and and so I I valued her and and her husband. But I think I was especially moved by their son, Dr. Giglioni, who uh, went to Columbia, the only son to go to school, you know, to college, uh, became a surgeon, served the Italian community, you know, which is uh, lower class income uh, in Seattle, didn't ask for money if people didn't have it. Um, and uh, he's in the middle of this picture, the guy with the big nose and the mask, uh, um, and uh, was uh, head of surgery at the major hospital in, in Seattle and uh, uh, president of the board of surgeons and all of that. And then was the representative for the Italian community in the region. The, at that time, the Italian government had a representative because people were expected to serve who were Italian citizens in the, in the Italian army. 
But at any rate, he came out uh, publicly in papers uh, defending immigrants when they were being attacked. You know, it was a constant attack on Chinese, Japanese, and Italian immigrants in Seattle. And um, I, it just uh, it it just struck me as such a powerful statement from him. Uh, and so, uh, in contrast to what we're hearing from our president these days about immigration, it, it caused a lot of experiences caused me to think about. United States today, obviously, attitude toward refugees and immigrants, when really, you know, the people we interviewed, the Vietnamese Americans, especially, we, we were, thanks to Dan, were introduced to people I wouldn't have uh, been able to inter interview ordinarily. Um, it was interesting to see the Vietnamese American experience be quite similar to the Italian American experience from an earlier generation. And when you get to Seattle, you're reminded, you know, that some high percentage of the the companies that are started are started by immigrants or their descendants. And so they're very important to our country that they are more, they're really more American than the quote, real Americans that uh, politicians are all talking about. Um, and it's, it's important that, uh, I mean, that's one of, if there are a half dozen conclusions I came up with out of the trip, it was one of them was that we really need to take a look favorably upon refugees and immigrants and try to figure out how to solve our problems in terms of numbers better than that we have uh, recently. So I have a few more questions, but we have a, some coming in as well from people who are watching and listening. So I wanna uh, filter some of those in as we continue to talk uh, among ourselves. From uh, Professor Lowe, uh, were there any scary or uncomfortable moments during your trip? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I'm happy to introduce one, uh, but I think uh, uh, Alyssa may, may recall part of it better than I do, but I'll just start by saying in San Francisco, uh, our van was broken into and uh, it, it was disturbing because the camera was taken, uh, Alyssa's two suitcases were taken, our, our two video, uh, two uh, uh, laptops were taken. But on, the, but on the camera, there were, you know, there were interview, video interviews that, um, that we lost and that was really disturbing to us. And we were exhausted by that time in San Francisco. Uh, and the police didn't show up. So after several hours, we wound up going to a police station to report the loss. The next morning, the story got better in that Alyssa got a text message. Or well, I'll let Alyssa tell the story. Yeah, I um, I got a tweet from a, a total stranger, like, "Where are you?" And you probably shouldn't answer those, but I did. Um, and I said, "We're in San Francisco." And this woman said, "Oh, did you mean to leave your suitcase on the street?" And I was like, "No, no, it was stolen." Um, and she had it. Um, and it was just like the most remarkable story. Um, she had unzipped it and found like a stack of, of cards or something um, and, and found my name and, and tweeted. Um, so we were able to get that. Uh, we, we were able to recover that one thing. Um, uh, my, they did steal actually my biography of Mark Twain um, out of the front pocket of the suitcase, which I thought was very strange. Um, but I hope whoever got it enjoyed it. Um, but the woman who found the suitcase, her name was Kimberly Kills. Um, she, uh, turns out she is a transgender adult film actress. Um, and we actually ended up interviewing her for the book and, and getting some of her story. Um, so she did a great deed um, and, uh, and, and became one of our, our sources. So, you know, many things were never recovered, but some things were found. It's a great story about serendipity, too, on a road trip like that. Um, so now we've gotten across the country. Um, we're all the way across. Um, uh, the three of you have reached the coast. And if I'm reading the book right, um, uh, and this beautiful weave, I should mention, of three distinct voices uh, 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 in, the, in, in the book. Um, if I read it right, you you all were expecting some big bigger epiphany maybe that happened, um, and um, you know as a California boy, I would have 
like to have seen that sense of reaching the water and having some resolution. But I think what, uh, what, what your reflections about that show us is that you've been on this exploration, exploring the unfinished business of the country in, in um, looking at identity and the struggle for equality of uh, different kinds of groups. And it's unfinished, right? There's a poem from Walt Whitman, another writer um, who knew California well that begins, now I face home again, very pleased and joyous, but where is what I started for so long ago? And why is it uh, yet unfound? Um, our former colleague, David Abramson asks, what from the experience of the trip did you learn about yourself? And what did you learn about the country that you didn't um, know before? And I think that's a decent place to round out our conversation, maybe starting with you, Elisa, uh, in, in wrapping things up. Yeah, um, I, I just remember ending the trip feeling very overwhelmed. Um, it's hard to, one, sort of, in effect, be homeless uh, for a couple of months. You know, there's no familiar couch you can throw your feet on at the end of the day. Um, and I also remember being struck by sort of the darkness and, and I think, frankly, the violence um, of so much of American history that, you know, they teach you sort of the basics in school, but there were just so many things that I just had no idea about. Um, I remember at the end of the trip, we visited Angel Island, um, which is an immigration center um, off the coast of San Francisco. And, you know, it really turned into a detention center for many Chinese immigrants um, and just held in, in awful conditions. And I, I had never heard of it. Um, and it felt so recent to me and, and horrible. So I, I really had a lot of trouble digesting all of this. Um, at the same time, we met so many wonderful people um, working to change things and, and to say, I wanna shape the country this way or I wanna shape my community this way. Um, and that gave me hope, so a little bit of everything. I'm gonna slip one last question in from our, our viewers before I come to Dan and Lauren. Alex uh, says, as Hong Kongers, we could not value freedom more than we have in the last few years. In hindsight, what did this journey teach uh, you three about the value of freedom in the US, considering the current health, uh, public health crisis? And um, here's a really big one, but if you have some thoughts, um, maybe a new administration would need them. How can the U.S. restore its role of catalyst of progress and um, and a symbol of freedom in the world? I, I'm sorry, Doug. I didn't hear the last question. So uh, the the tag along it's really about um, you know this comparative view from from Hong Kong at the moment about um, the value of the U.S. as a as a symbol of freedom for for other people. Um, and as a catalyst for at least a discussion about that, um, even as Elisa says, so much history of this country falling short as well. Maybe Dan, okay. you have some yeah. thoughts about that since you're living there. Sure. Um, what this question brings to mind, uh, you know, we interviewed Duania Kyles in um, in Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, and, yes. Yeah, and she was one of the first to desegregate the schools. And um, I remember we met her at a, you know, um, photo exhibit of, you know, um, of all the kind of civic uprisings and protests and this, and this sort of proud history um, in the city. And, you know, living in Hong Kong through these last few years with, with the protests going on reminded me a lot of what happened in the US and sort of the freedoms that Americans enjoy um, you know, thanks to the freedom, freedom of assembly and the ability to express themselves and to voice their political dissent. So, um, so yeah, just really being here um, makes me realize my privilege um, being an American and being able to 
to protest. And, and this, summer, this summer as well, the Black Lives Matter protests in America, even though I wasn't in the States during the time, I mean, it, it is such a remarkable thing that we have in the US to be able to you know, voice ourselves like this. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Any other closing thoughts from you, Dan? Um, I think I, I agree with Alyssa what she had to say about the history of violence in this country. You know, we visited uh, a few prisons, some of the maximum security. We visited the sites of horrific murders. Um, we went to Money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was brutally murdered. We went to Laramie, Wyoming, where Matthew Shepard was murdered. And just to kind of reckon with that history, just on a personal level, was was very difficult. But also just to reflect also on how how we decide to memorialize these things, how do we decide to, um, to keep them in our collective memory or, or choose not to as well. This happens all the time. There's a lot of selective amnesia in the US as well. Angel Island also for me in San Francisco was a completely new revelation. So um, yeah, and, and on a lighter note, on a more personal level, just with my two travel companions, I mean, from Alyssa, I just took this joy of life and and you know we we just we're both very mutually committed to having fun throughout the trip so I'm really thankful that you know we got to get so close during this experience and um, Alyssa has a saying that it's either a good time or a good story and and that still holds true for me today and I, I still say it sometimes and and for Lauren um, you know the education at Medill is obviously amazing um, but I really, when I look back on my time as a student, this was really, you know, journalism, like 2011, 2012, but like on crack, you know, and, and uh, you know, just Lauren is an incredibly empathetic and incredibly meticulous journalist. And so just to have that front row seat to observe him interview people was, was such a privilege. And um, and just the fact that, you know, Lauren, Lauren was, uh, you know, 71, I think, during the trip and, and you're still trying to diminish your ignorance like that, that is so inspiring to me. And, uh, and I hold that very near to my heart as well. So before we let Lauren have the final word, uh, Elisa, do you want to say anything about that, uh, about what you learned from these two guys? Yes. Oh, we had such a marvelous time. You would think that you would hate each other after three months in a minivan, um, but I mean, I still call Lauren when I have a problem I can't solve. Anytime Dan is in New York, we have to see each other. Um, but Dan just has the most calming, inquisitive, like depth to him. Um, you know, he always came with up with these like just such thoughtful interview questions and really seem to try to see people and, and understand them. Um, and, and he's such a true friend. So I, you know, that spending time with Dan and Lauren really was like the best thing. Um, and with Lauren, Dan and I talked about this a lot, but um, we sort of felt like we were reliving chapters of his life. Um, you know, he was kind of reliving them and, and we were along for the ride and it was just, an immense privilege um, to be able to do that. Lauren, um, even when he wasn't, you know, in the official role of teacher, he, he kind of always was. And no matter what city we ended up in, um, there was always a former student or a former employee um, who just had to see him and had to thank him for supporting them and, you know, for being a mentor. And that was, like just that that's the best role model you could ever have to see someone who's had an impact on so many people who are so grateful and who have turned out to be so successful um, and have never forgotten him. And, and that I think is, I mean, that's all anyone can truly aspire to be. I think that's certainly what I think Dan and I um, took away from Lauren. Well, I'll, I'll pile on on that one point because I had the I had the pleasure of traveling several times to South Africa with Lauren and seeing the way I think I learned so much about traveling with students and uh, the way in which he opened up, as you're saying, to learning things from students and, and, and teaching in a very organic way, not didactic, but having the kind of openness that Dan is talking about. 
is a model for how we should be, not just as journalists, but as human beings. So, so Lauren, uh, after all that, you still get the last word. Well, uh, I'm blushing. So uh, I just want to make sure I get in uh, a thank you to Medillions who made this trip possible. There were five alums, Mary Lou Son, Nanette Demusi, Carolyn Bruce Hollenbeck, and especially Howard Dubin, who bankrolled this trip to the tune of $30,000. Uh, and on the road, a Medill alums, and in some cases their parents, put us up, fed us, in exchange for the gift of this, uh, I have to show you this, this elegant t-shirt, Mark Twain trip, but on the back is an important message. And uh, if you can see it there, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, a Mark Twain quote worth remembering. I just want to have one recollection myself, uh, um, and that is um, after the trip, John Carroll, a classmate of mine who was editor of the LA Times, uh, died. And I went back to Lexington, Kentucky to see him. And it caused me to uh, try to do learn more about Merlene Davis. We, uh, uh, African-American columnist in his paper, we interviewed. And uh, I learned that on her retirement that there was a story that we hadn't heard that reminded me of the power of racism and continuing problems that we need to address in this country. And that was that uh, she used to get hate mail uh, in response to her column. And uh, one letter she got said uh, usual stuff about her, but said uh, something about her daughter. We know where your daughter lives. And um, Merlene went to the editor of the paper who said, you need to take this to the police. And she did, and a police officer, white police officer came out to her house, read the letter, and said, you know, I, I uh, share some of the thoughts in this letter. And she uh, said to me, she said that she, well, she wasn't going to take any more letters to the police, that was for sure. And it just reminded me that uh, these are really life and death uh, issues that we're trying to address. And I, Hope the trip played some role in a, uh, increasing our understanding and certainly did increase mine. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I, I wish we had more time. This is a book that could be taught over 10 weeks uh, in a quarter uh, class, but we've tried to do it uh, justice here in, in an hour long conversation. Um, we've only gotten one layer down in a brilliantly uh, total mini layered account. And so that's why I strongly recommend uh, everybody who has been listening and watching uh, as soon as you sign off from this conversation to uh, follow the link to Bookends and Beginnings, our best uh, independent bookstore to order your copy right now while you're thinking of it. Big thanks for help in organizing this to Sarah Brazil, to Luis Palacios and Jeff Pra for ensuring the technology worked to Stacy Simpson for putting it all together, and to our Dean Charles Whitaker for his tireless promotion of faculty and student work and collaborations like this one. Most of all, thank you, Lauren, Alisa, and Dan, not just for the time today, for, but for the years of work, gathering these important untold stories and putting them together in such a moving way for the rest of us. And thanks to everybody for listening in and joining us for the conversation today. It's been an honor uh, for me to moderate. And that's it from me. Back to you, Stacey. Thank you, Doug. And thank you, everyone, for that enlightening and wonderful discussion about the book. It certainly piqued my interest and even more to, to read along and, and listen to more of the stories that match some of those awesome photos of all of you. So thank you very much for your time, Dan. Thank you for getting up at the crack of dawn in Hong Kong to join us tonight. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Again, please take a look at the slide that'll come up right after I finish speaking and jot down the link to Bookends and Beginnings and we thank them too for their continued support at Medill. Hope you also please join our, our check out our website. We have other programs coming up 
this fall and we hope you'll come back and join us for those as well. Everybody be well and thanks so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Stacy. Bye-bye. Thank you.